one thing that Zoom, that I found with Zoom, it's very quiet when you mute people. So I'm imagining people are applauding in the background in cyber world <laughs> today. Um, just a reminder, um, keep your, your screen on mute if you're not speaking and um, write any questions you have in the chat box. We'll be sure to get to those at the end. Um, I want to start us off, um, Dr. Mesa and Dr. Bedford, with um, sharing one of my favorite Maya Angela quotes. It goes like this, my mission in life is not simply to survive, but to thrive with compassion, some passion, some humor, and some style. How does this quote resonate with you? And Dr. Mesa, Mesa sorry, we'll start with you. Uh, well, you know, be, beyond the fact that Maya Angelou is one of my favorite authors and poets and an unbelievable force to be reckoned with, um, it, it, it shows the true inspiration that she models uh, for all women, Black women and women of color in terms of the idea that living in survival mode is really simply just not enough. Um, and we have... I think as a community and as a people normalized survival for a really long time and have convinced ourselves to believe that survival is, um, you know, the, the way that we exist. Um, and when we start to push past that as a community and start to understand the possibilities and in moving into thriving, um, that's when we open up a bunch of different pathways, um, not just to be compassionate with others, but most importantly, to be compassionate with ourselves. I think the hardest part for us as a community is to be forgiving and loving towards ourselves. Um, and I tell people all the time, you can't give what you don't have. If you can't be kind to yourself, you can't be kind to others. If you can't be loving to yourselves, you can't do it You know, to yourself, you can't do it with others. So, and, and of course, I mean, the biggest mind, mic drop for me is that you can do it with humor and you certainly can do it with style. So um, I just, I love every piece of, of this quote um, and it resonates for me as a woman because that's how I try to position myself in every space that I occupy, you know, um, and to continue to move past survival um, in a way that is unique to me um, and, and to the, you know, to my, uh, way of changing the world, not anybody else's, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. A um, lot of connection to that. I just love, I think for, for me, the piece that catches me in addition to all you said is that humor piece. And mm -hmm. I think therapies can be hard work and I love being able to bring humor to that space because it doesn't have to feel hard, right? Dr. Bedford, um, how about you? How does that quote resonate with you? You know, I think, um... I really like um, what Dr. Akbar said. Uh, I really appreciate like the the connections you made there. I I think for me, it it connects to this idea of strength based psychology. Um, so as a black psychologist and as a counseling psychologist, I think that there's an intersection there in terms of like focusing in on strengths instead of deficits. Um, when I work with people. Um, I like to find out what's working for them, you know, what's making them happy, what makes them feel good about their life, about themselves, um, what, what works in relationships, what works at work, um, and, and, and kind of try to build on that instead of focusing so much on fixing whatever seems to be broken. Um, I think that that helps us to pay attention to those opportunities to thrive. It, it helps us to kind of look and see what's out there and, and how to make ourselves happy and not just like be in, in and kind of continue in this like rat race type situation. Um, and I think it's, it's an inoculation against, you know, what some folks would call like colonial systems or, you know, oppressive systems that basically make people of color, women, anyone on the margins um, feel like they should be on the margins, you know, feel like we don't really deserve to, to be where we are. We don't deserve to be happy and comfortable where we are. We need to constantly be fighting, working more than other people, doing more, you know, uh, being more political, being more efficient. I mean, there's this whole um, meme out there that's telling people that if during the quarantine, you don't come up and build your own business or create your own, write your whole dissertation or something out there, 
then there's something wrong with you. And I, I mean, that's just the, that to me, that's the, the most ridiculous thing and hurtful thing you can, you can kind of put on people because we're literally living in a, in a worldwide crisis. And if folks, I mean, like if folks need to take a rest, if your pro productivity goes down, if you're productive at all, good job. Cause really everyone could just be chilling. I mean, like real talk, we're sitting at home hoping that folks that we love won't die and hoping that we won't get exposed. Um, so I think that when I think about thriving and I think about um, the quote that you used, uh, it, it, it just brings up this idea of like, you know, paying attention to what, what we've built for ourselves already and, and, and what we're built on. Yes, thank you. Very powerful. I knew I, I knew I was going to have a wonderful time with both of you. So thank you for opening up with that. Um, so let's um, dig into some of the work um, that you're doing. Actually, before we get there, I wanted to, because um, I know we have people who may be at different stages in their career in psychology. And one of the things that, you know, in a psych is really trying to help is to bring more people into the field, trying to create those pipelines and bring more people into business, um, private practice or whatever wellness business, businesses they want to start. But we know that people of color represent less than 15% of mental professionals in the field. So there are not many of us to begin with. And I think one of the things that I um, learned recently, it wasn't my experience, but um, I was speaking with some African and Caribbean students at a local university. And many of them shared that their families really discouraged them from, from pursuing a career in psychology or a degree in psychology. Um, so we know that there's stigma out there around seeking therapy, but it clearly runs deeper than that, right? We are getting messages from our families that this is not a valuable area to study. And sometimes we also know people get to grad school, there are a lot of barriers that you have to um, face as well to stay in the field. So I would love to hear from you, what inspired you to pursue a, a degree in psychology? And how did, you, how did you deal with people who might try to steer, steer you away from the field or try to put up barriers for you to be, being successful? And um, Dr. Akbar, we can start with you. Um, well, I, I think that what, it, what ignited my passion about psychology, and perhaps a lot of us may connect with this in, in different ways, is that uh, I had a lot of personal life experiences that were difficult for me to understand and comprehend growing up as an adolescent. And part of what I share in the book are pieces of that life story that um, resonate with my own urban trauma and what, what I um, went through. It's hard for us in, in this field to acknowledge that because what we're taught in school is that self-disclosure is a no-no um, and it's not appropriate. Um, and so I had to battle my own issues around shame and uh, guilt in terms of sharing my story publicly and being leaning into that and being okay with being in that vulnerable space. Um, but those life experiences really led me to think about my career um, as I was sort of muddling along and, and to Maya Angelou's quote, really in survival mode for a very long time past my undergraduate um, degree. And really it wasn't until I was at FAM, which is where I got my master's in community psych, I think during the time of, you know, the mecca of black psychology in the mid nineties, where, um, you know, all powerful black psychologists had some connection to, to, to FAM at that time that I really understand, began to understand my purpose. Can you tell us what FAM is? Oh, Florida A&M University. Thank you. So HBCU <laughs> down in Tallahassee. And for a Brooklyn girl, trust me, Tallahassee was not an easy place to live. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I began to understand at that point that my, per my clarity around my purpose. Um, so I had done an undergraduate degree in, at, at Albany, um, which was a PWI, you know, predominantly white institute. And, um, felt really lost in there in terms of where I was going to um, lead. There was a lot of research. Everything was focused on evidence-based work. I had 
an inclination that I wanted to work with the community but didn't understand to what capacity. I also didn't understand the diversity that exists in the field of psychology, the multiple avenues that we can choose, um, and the areas that we can have a lot of influence um, in terms of human behavior. So it was, it was complicated to navigate the, the world of psychology and where I was finally gonna land. But I think a lot of the instruction that I got when I was at Florida A&M was around um, black psychology and was around community psychology and the different ways in which I can position myself to be um, a change agent um, in our communities. And that started to shape the way that I was thinking. But I also knew that if I didn't go on to get a PhD, that my ability to do the scope of what I wanted to do was gonna be limited if I just terminated at a master's. So I had this sort of life story that I was carrying. I started to have some influence in terms of understanding that I wanted to be in community and be part of community. But I also wanted to keenly understand human behavior and why we made the decisions that we made and how our emotional well-being um, existed in, in a spectrum um, of different um, phases, depending on where we were, are, where we are, where we were with our life circumstances. Um, so then I went on to complete my PhD in a clinical psych program with a concentration in, in children. Um, and that uh, also started to define for me that, you know, I wanted to do clinical work. I didn't want to be necessarily a researcher, a researcher, but I honored research and I understood how it informed practice um, and how it was going to be uh, a piece that I used when necessary to support my work in the future. Um, and as I sort of went along later on, I got matched at Yale to do my pre and postdoc and that's how I um, ended up settling in New Haven. Um, I knew that I wanted to open my own practice. And I think perhaps to the audience that, that we're with right now, um, that's not always an easy task because you spend all these years in school trying to figure out how you're gonna be the best psychologist or the best therapist, counselor, social worker, um, family therapist that you can be, but nobody ever teaches you how to be a business person. You don't get a degree in business. You get a degree in your field of study and the expectation is that when you get into the field and you open up your own private practice, you are both a practitioner and a business owner. And so that, you know, um, were I did a lot of hard lessons. Um, there was no InnoPsych back in my day. So <laughs> a lot of hard lessons in terms of how, how to be a, um, you know, a business owner that was going to be, um, um, profitable and productive and help people all at the same time. Um, so lots of different dynamics there. But I, I always had a passion for, for the field, um, for psychology. I, I think you're right. I mean, I come from a Caribbean family and people were like, what is that? Like, I thought you were going to be like a real doctor, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I am a real doctor and a PhD is the highest level degree you can get. So thank you, sit down. Um, so, you know, it, it, it does come with its sort of um, uh, questioning and probably mistrust around the field being a real science, no matter how many times we have proven over and over again that we're a real science and that we inform a lot of the, um, the science that's out there. Um, so I, I do feel that, that it's, it's a, um, a field that many of us should get into because we, we are underrepresented in the landscape of that. And, you know, Charmaine and I have been in huge conferences and meetings where we are a very small minority compared to the rest of the, the landscape yeah. of psychology. Yeah. Um, so, so this is for me, I think, a a big passion and an area that I will continue to innovate in, um, uh, you know, from this point forward. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bedford, um, how about you? What was your inspiration to getting into the field? And did you encounter any barriers um, as along your path? Oh, uh, 
it, it, I, I'm sorry I have to chuckle when you say did I encounter any barriers. <laughs> uh, I feel like my whole path is a, like every thing is I run like the entire path to right now is hurdles, right? Mm. And not the nice like ordered hurdles. It's the ones that got the pit after the end. I don't know what you call that, mm. but like the one with the water at the end, and then you gotta do the high jump, and then like people start throwing stuff at you. Mm. If I can like characterize like I as a one of my earliest uh, educational interactions um, that I could talk about right here is when I was in first when I was in first grade going to second grade. Um, I passed the gate the gate program test exam to move into the gifted program, mm. and my teacher wanted to hold me back, mm. like hold me back wanted to hold me back a grade. You wow. see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I passed the gifted program and then was being told that wasn't good enough to move up to the next grade level. Mm -hmm. And that was like, basically, I mean, the, the hallmark of my experience in education and in mm -hmm. work and in other spaces has been that, you know, there have been some people who, I mean, honestly, I, I could not be here without the mentorship that I received from some people who took care of me at every single stage. Um, but, and um, there were also people who basically said, you can't do this, you know, you can't get into a UC. Um, you can't, you know, get this particular major. You can't graduate with this particular stuff. You can't go to grad school in this way. You can't, you know, all these different things. You need yeah. to maintain, manage your, your, your expectations. Um, uh, I don't want to sit too deep. I don't want to sit too, too much in that space around that, but like, um, the idea that I could get a doctorate as a first generation college student or a first generation college graduate and all that stuff um, wasn't necessarily, there was no promise of that except for in my own head and in the head of my family and, and the people who cared about me. So um, in terms of, so my, my route was I actually started off as an undergraduate. I went to, I, I've been at PWIs my entire time. Uh, so undergrad, master's, and doctorate were all PWIs. Um, and I, I have a, you know, I love my folks at the HBCUs and, and like Matt Props. I do have a special love for my PWI folks because I feel like it's a fight, like that everybody who, who experienced that being that 1% or that 3% at a college, there's a unique experience to that where you have to like fight for every single thing that you get every single moment, every single acknowledgement. Are you going to have a graduation, that, that a black graduation? Are you going to have a, a BSU or a ASU? Are you going to have a space to talk? Are you going to have that, that newspaper shut up and not do the, the negative stuff against us and like having to work for all of those things? I think it's a different like experience. And, I, and, and again, it's like, I feel like sometimes uh, like I, I want to like cap for my folks who kind of experienced that because it's a special kind of experience to be a black person going through a UC. That's some, that's some mind bending stuff. Um, while I was at the, so when I went to UC Irvine as an undergraduate, I actually had no idea I was gonna be a psychologist. Didn't think psychology was a thing. Um, the only psychologists I knew were uh, my mentors eventually. And I knew them as folks who I interacted with from student affairs, not through being, you know, not, not that I was going into their stuff. So in fact, the uh, first psychology course I took was a black psychology course was, you know, for me, the black psychology course, because it was Dr. White's course that was being taught at that time by Dr. Parham, Thomas Parham, Dr. Joseph L. White at UC Irvine. And um, I, you know, I'm sitting in there and I had no idea what to expect, but Dr. Parham ran the counseling center and he was like the biggest black man on campus. So I got to take his class because everybody said, take his class. And so I get in there and he starts talking about, um, you know, uh, the three questions from Fanon and, you know, like thinking about um, like the, the, the idea of kind of having dual personhood and, and all the different stuff that's coming up. And I'm like, hey, I experienced that. There's a name for that? I had, no, I had no idea. You know, I never knew, right? And that started to spark something yeah. for me in terms of like, there's this translative reality that I, I had no access to, but it speaks to everything that I'm interacting with in the world. Um, and what that led me to do was to do a minor in African-American studies, which is all they would allow you to do. There was no major. Um, 
And uh, on top of that, I did uh, my degree in anthropology. So psychology basically came from the idea that I wanted to do something that was oriented towards culture and like social sciences, but was practical and focused on our community. And so after graduating with those degrees, I actually went and spoke to Dr. Uh, Joseph L. White and Dr. Thomas Barham about, hey, so I've graduated, I have a completely different degree, how do I become a psychologist? Um, and instead of kicking me out of their offices, they, they both kind of put together plans to help me kind of change my trajectory, go into grad school. I uh, went and did like uh, conditionally classified graduate studies. So like a kind of undecided, undeclared kind of deal at Long Beach State. And then the next year in that, I did all my psych coursework as a graduate student. So um, it's just kind of a different way of approaching it. Um, and then did my uh, master's in psychology at Long Beach State, uh, where I was introduced to, uh, to, to Dr. Uh, Michael Connor, who was my thesis chair. And um, that's where I realized that as a person with a background in anthropology, um, I was different than most of the folks in the psychology department. Um, I spoke a different language. I understood things a little bit differently. And when I was going in there, it was literally cultural factors and cultural understandings and multiculturalism was the thing that helped me break through the imposter feelings of not being a person with a long standing psych background. Mm -hmm. And so I basically, that was my way of getting through in the class was like, okay, y'all gonna talk about Freud and, and Piaget and all these other folks. Well, you know, how about Margaret Mead? How about some of that? You know, y'all don't know about right. that, you know, and just throw some things in there. Uh, mm -hmm. What about Fanon? You know, like, so um, that led to applying to get the doctorate and I ended up going to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, um, which uh, kind of like, uh, kind of like FAMU, I think, um, as a Southern California guy, as a black man from Southern California, going to a place that's, um, two hours east of St. Louis. Um, it, it, it was it was very, very interesting being surrounded by corn and Confederate flags. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, that was, that was a, but it was a, it was a really good experience. Um, the, I was in the counseling psychology doctoral program and uh, the, you know, what, I don't know if everybody knows this, but like there's a lot of, some powerhouse people went through there. I mean, like, um, like Janet Helms taught there for a while and Kevin Coakley taught there for a while and the Parhams, all the Parhams went there, you know, and it's just like, uh, there's, there's a effect of that, you know, um, and when I was there, Esmond Ari Obasi was uh, one of the people who was faculty and I, I came up kind of under uh, Kathy Schwalis, who's an awesome ally. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was I, I learned, a, what'd you say? So you have a great genealogy. Well, Love you that. know, <laughs> and so the reason that I bring up people's names like this is because um, I strongly, I deeply believe in like the importance of our ancestors and importance of mentorship. I literally, I, I am some dude who had a hard time with authority, who didn't like to, um, who, who, who felt like he was, could just kind of get through a class without organizing stuff and, and, and like managing time and was able to do that for a long time until I couldn't. And then I had black people, mostly black women and black men who grabbed me and said, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna do this right. You know? And at every single step, when I felt like, oh, I need to bounce, this isn't gonna work out. Someone would say, no, nah, you tripping, come on. We're gonna, we're gonna keep doing this, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I feel, like, I feel like a fraud if I don't acknowledge those people because at each point there was like a inflection point. Um, so Which in terms is, of- yeah. I was going to say, that's awesome because I, uh, that's great to have that experience. I, I remember, I, and I, I kind of envy both of your experiences in terms of the support and mentorship you have going through, um, coming from um, an, another country, and then my program was predominantly white. Um, I did have a couple um, people of color in my, in my cohort, which was great. Um, but I remember having my multicultural course by someone who's very bigoted. <laughs> so it's just interesting. I just love kind of the history that you guys are bringing and adding to this conversation. I want to shift gears a little bit because I just want to be mindful of time. Um, and I'm going to kick it back to you, um, Dr. Palmer. I want to talk a little bit about what inspired you to write, Why Am I, Daddy, Why Am I Brown? My daughter loves it. I love talking to them about 
skin color and you know they're at a private school predominantly white institutions and so I was like they, they know me as a diversity person <laughs> so you know I feel it's my job if I because you know they're not going to do it they're not going to do it as well as I can so mm-hmm. as I mentioned the kids had a really great time but I'm curious to hear what was your hope in writing the book you know what was your hope in, in putting that information out there to us in our community so my hope was thank you that, that I mean that's really kind first of all like that you know I mean that you took the book and you read it to a class and I mean, that, that's kind of the, the coolest piece of this is hearing about kids who, who are exposed to it and what their responses are and, um, and hopefully it being helpful. Um, the, the, the reason I wrote it was to try to prevent negative interactions that a lot of, a lot of us experience as a kid, you know, especially if you have brown skin, um, how folks will come up and not like kids, other kids' peers will not be taught properly how to understand what it means to have, you know, melanin in your skin. Um, and teachers and professors and like you say, like your multicultural uh, professor who's already got multiple degrees and all this other stuff still don't understand basic stuff about why, why we look different. Um, so it... I, I started, I wrote the book after having a conversation with my partner. Um, she was at the time working at a, um, at a school where they had uh, K through, you know, K through 12, uh, I think it was K through middle school. But um, basically a little kid who was a little girl who was in a uh, kindergarten or first grade came up to her, a little brown person and uh, was crying because their classmate had said something to the extent of, your skin looks like poop, you know, Mm -hmm. and come to find out that this came up after a lesson on colors and skin tone. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in my mind, I'm like, how do you, how does that happen after a lesson on this? You know, how does that happen after a teacher explains this stuff? And what I realized listening to my partner and, you know, watching as she was kind of dealing with the hurt and the anger and all the stuff and like me vicariously feeling it, um that there wasn't tools that really adequately address what it means to have skin color you know have all of us have skin color because no you know we we learn this i think our parents might tell us or we learn this at some point where it's like well i'm not really black i'm brown and white people aren't really white they have they're peach or they're some other color you know and and but you're never really taught that language there's not really good tools for it um, the crayons don't don't match. Even the ones that are supposed to be skin colored and 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 the woke Crayolas aren't really woke. They're they're still limited. Um, and so what I thought was, you know, what if I use what I know as a psychologist, as a person who focuses on multicultural competence and and has certain language, what would what would happen if I wrote this for kids, knowing that adults are going to have to read it to the kids most of most of the time. And so. <laughs> you know, this conversation would happen and maybe we could have this corrective experience instead of a corrective re-experience later. Right. Um, right. So, yeah. So like, and that's why, I mean, there's resources in there. I put a skin chart I had to go and find. Uh, luckily, we live in the time of Fenty. So I was able to go and find some actual skin colors that would match a bunch of people. And like, there were articles um, about language and how to really talk about color. Um, and how to like take away like instead of using food colors so instead of saying coffee using something like you know russet brown or something like that you know and so moving away from consumables and being really descriptive and and trying to build language and and connect it to the reality that it's not um it's not culture and color aren't the same thing color comes from how far you are from the equator excuse me your ancestors back in the day were um so we need to stop putting character on that and, and really just talk about that stuff. That's an aspect and it affects how people treat us, but understanding people via it doesn't make sense. It's not scientific. Yeah. It's not a good idea. No, I love that. Um, and I think one, why I love the book so much is because there were a couple of books around where talk about color and food. I'm like, this is not science. This is <laughs> a little ridiculous. So I appreciate it. I think there was one other book that was that's not as kid friendly so i love that yours was able to bring make it really kid relevant but also have the science of what, uh, in terms of how we got a skin color 
Thank you for sharing that and for bringing that to us. Um, Dr. Akbar, I would love to hear from you in terms of what prompted you to write Urban Trauma and what was your hope in putting this information out here for our community? It's funny, I was just uh, literally just yesterday uh, trying to answer that question because mm. there's a workbook that uh, is going live in the next few days that's gonna accompany the book and the beginning section of it uh, describes why I wrote the, the book. And first I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you sort of like the motivation. Uh, I'm sure as providers around, um, you know, around this table here, many of us sit in spaces where we are trying to um, advocate for children and for families and to have consideration for the experience of people of color and for their voice to be heard through, um, through our lens as an advocate for those communities. And, you know, it was, again, one of those situations where I was the only one in the room and there was a lot of talk of those kids and they're so poor and so disenfranchised and at risk and non-compliant. And, you know, the labels just kept going on and on and on. And every label just felt like another, you know, um, another negative label that we needed to carry and that our children needed to carry. And I just had enough that day. I had enough of having to sit around a table and I just made a, a conscious decision that I no longer wanted to be a passenger or sit on the bleachers or watch, be a, a, a standby or watching this go on. And that I was gonna become active in terms of um, creating a more a uh, practical definition to the experiences that we go through um, in this society. And so that, you know, I think to, to every, at least in my life, to every um, major decision that I've made, there's been like a catalyst moment, you know? I mean, what could say that COVID is a catalyst moment, you know, for us. And for some of us, it'll look differently. Um, and so for me, that was my catalyst moment. It was the moment that I felt like I needed to go from just being a, a, a thriving psychologist in so many ways to being an activist and to um, positioning what I knew um, in the realm of racial justice, because that's really what it needed to be called, um, but we don't call it that in psychology. Um, and in fact, they all always say like, oh, that's for those organizers and the activists and the social, you know, social change people, um, but we do that too. You know, that, that's an important piece of what we do. And a lot of times when we are creating advocacy, it is around the injustices that happen in our communities. And so that was the inspiration, at least for me. And then the motivation was because I felt like there was, at that time, Joy DeGray was, had already published her book and she was talking a lot about um, post-traumatic slave syndrome which I thought was very groundbreaking in the way that she positioned the, the idea of historical and generational race-based trauma um, and what that looks like in terms of symptomatology uh, for, for the, black, the Black experience. And so there was sort of her body of work that was out there. There was new groundbreaking work around epigenetics and the idea that we carry, um, you know, uh, in our DNA, there are genetic markers of trauma and that there's a genetic, um, there's a gene that's been identified. And as a result of consistent and multi-generational exposure to trauma, that gene gets, you know, variated in, in multiple ways, which then lead to health complications and, you know, a, a host of mental health issues. Um, and then there were also these studies out about ACE, you know, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And they all lived in isolation um, or siloed. They were, they were there and they existed. And what I wanted to do is do a compilation of bringing that all together and then call it something that our people could understand, right? I didn't want to make it too academic, but I wanted to make it real enough that it was contextual. And so that's what I did. And so urban trauma and its definition is really looking at the historical, the biological and the environmental factors um, that affect us as a people. And then 
um, you know, that we don't really understand or have the framework to be able to communicate with one another about. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll say things that describe it, but we have no, we, we up until that point, at least from my perspective, had no clear, um, you know, uh, concise, holistic way of describing that. And I, you know, um, the book brings that pe those pieces in, creates the framework, um, supposes characteristics that we develop as a result of urban trauma so that you can identify with those characteristics. There's six of them, anger, mistrust, perceptual error, fear, um, rejection. And, um, and, and so the, the combination of those um, you know, characteristics then allow us to identify how we show up um, you know, in the spaces mm -hmm. that we occupy, whether it's with our relationships or in our community or in the job. Um, and then promotes a conversation around what the healing path could look like. A lot of times if we don't understand what's happening inside of us, then we can't identify how to get to a healing space. Um, and that healing space looks differently for everyone. I don't prescribe what that looks like for people. I give some suggestions. I certainly talk about resiliency because we've always been a resilient people. Sometimes we're resilient people in spite of rather than, you know, because we're just in a space to heal. We do it because no matter what we've done, we're going to survive this. We're going to get through this. We're going to, you know, you can't, you, you're not going to break me. You're not going to put down. I will do that. I'll get this degree on top of that degree on top of that. I will be everything, the best of everything that I can, the mother, the, you know, every. And so that's exhausting. It's just exhausting. And so it's kind of allowing people just to be and to really reflect and think about what their, that, that healing journey is going to be for them. And so um, that was my motivation around writing it. Um, and I think it's contextualized that for a lot of people and a lot of people have been able to identify with it. Um, and so that, you know, to me, that's, that's been the work and I'm excited about the workbook because it's a guide for professionals to be able to use in, in conjunction with treatment so that we don't always have to rely heavily on, the, on psychopathology and on diagnostic labels um, if that, if that is, you know, in fact, what's happening with the community that you're servicing, that's fine. But in parallel, you can use the urban trauma framework to understand what race-based trauma, sh how it, how it looks and how it shows up in those, in those, um, you know, your clients or the people that you're working with. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I definitely encourage people to get the book and I'm excited to know that there's a workbook to go with it. Um, so let's move into um, just looking at, see how much time we have here. Um, I was going to go to COVID, but I think, <laughs> I don't think we have time. <laughs> so let's, let's just talk a little bit more about healing, right? Because I, you know, that's where I want to put our focus. Um, so, you know, I'll kind of open it up in a general way. You know, Bedford, we can start with you what do you either see as the barriers to healing or kind of what are you see actually maybe we start more about just focus on kind of the positives what are you see as some pathways to healing for people of color maybe in your work in school you know in terms of what you teach your students in your private practice you know what are some pathways to healing that you found helpful for people in your in your community um i think one of the, the main pieces is being able to call out what's real and to find one's own reality around around um, I think we got stuck are y'all there the, yeah thank you okay. you're you're stuck for a minute. <laughs> Um, so what I was saying is that, um, I work with a lot of folks who move through systems and they, um, have to contend with the idea of like, is this really happening or is this not happening? You know, so is this manager treating me different because I'm a person of color or because I'm a woman or because of, you know, like, is, is this coworker doing things behind my back is, you know, are, are these things at school happening this way? Um, I think that one of the biggest things that for me has been liberating is being able to just call it what it is and figure out ways to do that in systems that don't leave you vulnerable. 
you know, so how do you document things? How do you take care of like, um, like mentoring other people and being mentored? How do you build relationships? How do you build yourself into a space where you become indispensable and other folks can't really mess with you? Um, I think that those are, you know, I guess like one of the things that is deeply important or for, for me is having options and choices. Um, and how do you build out those options and choices by like understanding the reality around you? Um, so that tends to be where I work with folks around is like, let's, let's talk about what's actually happening. Let's talk about, let's be critical of, um, of the way that the world is working and of the way that we're interacting with it and see where, where truth isn't really being told. Um, and I think that when you, when you do that, you can kind of help people to, to get to a space where they can, they can start making decisions about what they think is going to be healthy for them and what's going to work for them. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Akbar, I know in your, in Urban Trauma, you shared a number of stories from individuals um, from their trauma to healing path. What are you see as some um, key takeaways or things that you might want to share in terms of how people get on, start to get on that path for healing on that journey? I know you talked also about some, um, some culturally responsive um, therapeutic strategies that really brought our cultural heritage into being, into play. You know, so talk a little bit about how you see healing and how do people start to get on that path? Yeah, I mean, I think like Dr. Palmo said before, it's so important to like honor and play, pay homage to um, the folks that came before, before us. I feel so privileged that, you know, there were a lot of paths that were open for me to be able to do this work. And one of the people that I want to highlight is um, Enola Aird. She um, runs a company called the Community Healing Network. And within the Community Healing Network, she runs what's called Emotional Emancipation Groups. And those Emotional Emancipation Groups have been co-authored with the Association of Black Psychology, Black Psychology one, of the, one of their members there. And I think that um, as we are engaging in this work of supporting, of being healers, because that's what we are at the end of the day. I mean, spiritually, ancestrally, we are healers. Um, we have to sort of think about what our own healing practices are going to look like and how we sort of go back into that mode um, of our ancestral given rights, right? Like claiming our, our rightful position in this world. Um, and Enola's capacity to bring those em emotional emancipation circles, which she teaches all around the country and literally in the Caribbean and all around the world. Um, so I, I encourage you to go onto her website and see when and how she's giving them next. Um, is one, I think, of the most important practices that we can do if this is the kind of healing work that you want to get into. Um, and really what it does is trying to rewrite some of those narratives that we have be believed in our minds to be truths that are actually not truths. And she talks about, you know, um, the difference between white superiority and how that turns into black inferiority, right? And to mm -hmm. dissect that difference and to make sure that we are not buying into the propaganda of black inferiority, because mm -hmm. that's that's all it is. It's propaganda, right? Um, and so I, I would recommend that as one of the ways. Um, there are other, you know, practitioners out there as well that do this kind of work. Um, right now, there is an app that's called Liberate. If you would like to get co more connected to fighting race-based trauma through meditation, yoga, and those types of healing practices, Liberate is a, it's a fantastic digital platform to do that. Um, I have, I know many of my colleagues who are instructors on that um, platform. It's easy to upload and it is ran by people of color for people of color. I really believe in FUBU, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, they were onto some back in the day. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so there are th those practices. And of course, always finding, I think, um, you know, like Dr. Palmer said, a mentor that can support you through your, 
you know, through your journey, because it's a combination of not only the emotional healing and the mental healing and also the mental decon, you know, deconstruction of what we have had to learn to be true. It's also people guiding you in the right, um, in the right direction that are for you, that are not trying to dim your light, that are not trying to break you down, but are trying to lift you in every kind of way because they see the spirit that you are and what you're trying to create. And don't, you know, Oprah said it, don't, don't be around energy suckers. If you've identified those people in your circle and, and they continue to suck your energy, you need to cut them so that you can be in your right light, you know? So I, I would definitely recommend any one of those things to, um, to support the healing practices and, and to um, support the community in understanding that these are ways um, for, for us to be able to do it. And of course, you know, um, like I said about the workbook, it, it does take you through being able to manage all of those characteristics of urban trauma um, and support healing in that way. So that, that's, that would be my recommendation just for the sake of time. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you, wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, I'd love to open up if there are any questions um, from the group. If you want to type your question in and we'll, um, we'll raise it up for everyone to see. I know there was a mention about an app. Liberate. Liberate, okay. Um, if no questions, um, what's next for you guys in your entrepreneurial journey? There's a question. There's a question. There's the question. Okay. Um, uh, how, how, um, how have you integrated culturally based assessments into no. your work? So I know. Um, at, Dr. Akbar, you do test in, so you want to take that one? Um, so culturally relevant uh, assessment, you know, that's really difficult, right? The majority of our, uh, the assessments that, um, especially if you're trying to work with insurance companies or with other people that are um, uh, accepting of the assessment protocols that you use, we, it, it's been very difficult to move away from the, stand, the regular standardized assessments um, that are traditionally used. But what I try to always do when I do my assessment, assessments, whether it's cultural linguistic diversity, is point out how that the influence of culture or the influence of language um, impacts the numbers in a certain kind of way or impacts the diagnostic formulation. Um, so it's not it's not because I'm able to use culturally sensitive measures, but I do use my, my specific lens and bring that into the report um, to assure that it's an accurate representation of the, the, the child or adult being assessed. Um, I, I don't know if that's helpful, but honestly, that piece of the science has not for, you know, moved uh, as far as it needs to in terms of its cultural sensitivity. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And um, the work that I do as a forensic psychologist, it's really about educating the courts when I'm doing the assessment. I kind of do my own um, cultural assessment and include that in whatever reports I write. Um, question here, how can we partner with Black churches? I feel like we have a large gap as it relates to outreach. The churches are great. It's great for spiritual healing, but what about mental healing? Um, I think that is a great question and um, some work that I have started to do in my practice in connecting with churches um, around that. I have a home church, which is really open to mental health. And so we actually use May as a way to bring awareness um, to mental health. But I think that's a great point, um, Naisha. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just wrap it up as we're almost out of time. So what's next for you, both of you? I know, Dr. Akbar, you have a workbook coming up. Anything else you want to share with us, either you or Dr. Palmer? Yeah, so my next project um, uh, after the workbook is that I've, um, it's a, the manuscript is in draft format. So I've actually written a step-by-step -step guide for allies. I was really tired of 
um, also being in, you know, doing my speaking engagements and, and a lot of workshops and uh, white at people who um, either self-define or really are white allies having a lot of trouble in understanding what that um, roadmap looks like and, and supporting, um, so being an ally, not in the way that they define it, but in the way that makes sense for us. Mm -hmm. So that book um, is due to come out in September um, and it is a step-by-step -step guide on all the areas of um, you know, white um, privilege and then also what, what is an efficient model. I, I evaluate every model of allyship, which by the way, almost 100% of them have been written by white people. Um, and instead what I do is I provide a guide towards allyship from the eyes of a person of color. Great, thank you. Dr. Palmer? Um, right now, I think uh, where I'm focused at is uh, I, I have been conducting a lot of research around um, privilege identities and uh, privilege attitudes. So we developed a, um, uh, a, what do you call it, a survey that basically uh, looks at privileged attitudes um, across seven different factors. So looking at white privilege, um, uh, male privilege, cisgender privilege, uh, religious privilege, uh, nationality privilege, and um, class privilege. And so, um, and a, yeah, and so um, we're in the process of writing up the papers for that. Um, we found some really interesting results and the idea is to be able to have an actual um, inventory you can use to assess like where people are in terms of mm. their privilege attitudes across mm. all these different factors mm. um, and see if there's ways to, to, if you can change that, right? So the idea is like, if we're doing multicultural social justice education, like how do you mark whether it's working or not? And we don't have a lot of tools that can kind of look at this in a broad way. There's like very specific tools out there and like very specific stuff. Um, but I think that like in, I think um, similar to the uh, COBRAs, um, Helen Neville's work, like um, I think we're trying to kind of do um, something that's more omnibus and like uh, something that can possibly become uh, a useful thing for folks out there doing consulting work and trying to kind of put evidence behind um, whatever particular uh, approach to multicultural and social justice education that they're doing. Great, awesome. Very good. You guys are very, very um, productive. I love the social justice mission that all of your projects um, hold. Um, so we're out of time, but um, I just want to thank you again for being our first guest on this, I'm not sure, live chat. I'm not sure where it's going, but we'll see. I always enjoy speaking and connecting with each of you. And I knew that the audience would also, would also. Um, you're both amazing. Continue to do your amazing, inspiring work. Um, again, big shout out to all the work that you're doing. Please get their books, Urban Trauma, um, Daddy Wyan Brown, and look up for the workbook that's coming up for Urban Trauma. Thank you again, and let's continue to heal. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'll end the meeting.